Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. So Peter and John were both commissioned by Jesus and recognized by the early Christians as apostles, special ambassadors of Jesus. Acts chapter 2 verse 43 told us many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. Acts chapter 3 tells us of an, uh, a specific example, one of many. And so apparently Peter and John saw no problem in continu continuing their Jewish custom of prayer at certain hours of the day. Uh, Morgan will point out that Peter and John were not going to the temple at the hour of sacrifice, but at the hour of prayer that followed the afternoon sacrifice. They realized the sacrificial system was fulfilled in the perfect sacrifice Jesus offered on the cross. So the Jewish historian Josephus described this gate on the Temple Mount made of fine Corinthian brass, 75 feet high with huge double doors, so beautiful that it greatly excelled those that were only covered over with silver and gold. So the lame man simply wanted to be supported in the condition that he was in. God had something better in mind. Jesus wanted to completely change his condition. Of course, the lame man felt that he had no other option than to be supported in his condition, but it certainly better for him to be supported than to starve to death. In addition, the man had good reason to believe that begging at the beautiful gate could support him. There was and is a strong tradition of almsgiving, giving to the poor uh, in Judaism, and doing it as an act of righteousness. Verse 4 through 6, And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So the man must have been happy and encouraged when Peter and John looked at him intently. Most people who want to ignore beggars are careful not to make eye contact with them. <clears throat> and when they looked at the lame man so intently, he probably thought he had a big gift coming. And so this lame man returned the eye contact with Peter and John. Perhaps he stretched out his hand or a cup to receive their generosity. Uh, and so the lame man was correct in expecting to receive something from them, but he received much more than just a monetary donation that he would have been satisfied with. Many have yet to come to the place where they can really expect something from God. This is faith, plain and simple. Even if the man expected less than Jesus wanted to give. Better yet, we should expect the right things from God. We're often much too ready to settle for much less than what God wants to give us. And our low expectations often rob us. And so Peter didn't have any money, but he did have the authority from Jesus to heal the sick. Uh, Peter knew what it was like to have God use him to heal others because Jesus had trained him to do this in Luke chapter 9 verses 1 through 6. Um, for some people to say silver and gold I don't have is about the worst thing that could be said. They feel th that the church is, the, is in ruins if it must say silver and gold I don't have. But it's much worse if the church never has the spiritual power to say in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk. And so he gave the lame man power in the name of Jesus, but he could not give it unless he had it in his own life. Many people want to be able to say, rise up and walk, without having received the power of Jesus to transform their own life. Verse 7 through 10. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So it's one thing to say, rise up and walk. It's a much greater thing... To, uh, to so boldly take the man's hand and lift him to his feet. So at this moment, Peter received the gift of faith that's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, a supernatural ability to trust God in a particular situation. And so strength did not come to the lame man until Peter said, rise up and walk, and not until Peter took him by the right hand and lifted him up. 
And as soon as he was healed, the formerly lame man did three good things. First, he attached himself to the apostles. Second, he immediately started to use what God gave him. He was walking and leaping. Finally, he began to praise and worship God. And this man was more than 40 years old in Acts chapter 4, verse 22, and had been crippled since birth. He was a familiar sight at the temple gate in Acts chapter 3, verse 10. Um, therefore, Jesus must have passed him by many times without healing him. And so we can say that Jesus didn't heal his because um, his sickness or his uh, disability because God's timing is just as important as his will. And it was for the greater glory of God that Jesus healed this man from heaven through the apostles at this time. All right, verse 11 and 12. Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us, as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? So since he could walk, it wasn't for support. Uh, perhaps he held on to them out of gratitude or a combined sense of fear and surprise, since a crowd quickly gathered. And uh, Peter wisely took advantage of the gathering crowd, yet he knew that the phenomenon of the miraculous in itself brought no one to Jesus. It merely aroused interest. Though they were greatly amazed, they were not saved yet. And this might have been a good time for a testimony service, for the healed man certainly had a great experience. Yet Peter knew that what the crowd needed to hear, even more than the healed man's experience, was the gospel of Jesus Christ and a call to repent and believe. The healed man didn't know enough yet to share that, so Peter did the talking. And Peter knew that saving faith does not come by seeing or hearing about miracles. Rather, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. So Peter denied that the healing was due to either his power or godliness. And there are many evangelists or preachers today who would never claim to heal in their own power still give the impression that healing happens because they're so spiritual or that they are so close to God or godly people. Peter knew that it was all of Jesus and nothing was of him. So Peter's point is simple here. Jesus healed all sorts of people when he walked the earth. So why should it seem strange that he continues to heal from heaven? Verse 13 through 15. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. So by opening with this reference to God, Peter made it clear that he spoke to them about the God of Israel, the God represented in the Hebrew Scriptures. The greatness of Peter's sermon is that it's all about Jesus. The focus on the sermon was not on Peter or anything that he did. It's all about Jesus, as should the sermon should still be today. Uh, not our own opinions or cherry-picking verses. And so the first thing Peter said about Jesus in the sermon drew attention to the idea that Jesus was the perfect servant of the Lord and spoken of in the Hebrew scriptures like Isaiah 42 and chapter 52 and chapter 53 of Isaiah. Uh, the concept of the servant of the Lord was well known in Israel because of Isaiah chapter 53 and other texts. And so Peter boldly set the guilt of Jesus' death squarely where it belonged. Pilate, the Roman governor, was determined to let him go, but the Jewish mob insisted on the crucifixion of Jesus in John chapter 18, verse 29, all the way to chapter 19, verse 16. And so this does not mean that the Jewish people of that day alone were responsible for the death of Jesus. The Romans, Gentiles, were also responsible. The Romans would not have crucified Jesus without pressure from the Jewish leaders, and the Jews would not have crucified Jesus without Roman acceptance of it. So God made sure that both Jew and Gentile shared in the guilt of Jesus' death. In fact, it was not political intrigue or circumstances that put Jesus on the cross. It was our sin. If you want to know who put Jesus on the cross, look at me or just look in the mirror. So yet in, you'll notice the contrast, right? Peter was not afraid to confront their sin and he showed this amazing boldness. Uh, but the contrast here in God's estimation, Jesus is the exalted servant promised centuries before in the Hebrew scriptures. In man's estimation, Jesus was only worthy to be tortured and crucified. So here... 
uh, Peter exalted Jesus as God by calling him Holy One, and that is used more than 40 times in the Old Testament as a high and glorious title for Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel. Uh, one of the ironies of the crucifixion of Jesus is that while the crowd rejected Jesus, they embraced a criminal and a murderer named Barabbas in Luke chapter 23 and John chapter 18. And so B Peter boldly confronted this audience. So when Peter spoke of sin, he used the word you several times. In the sermon on the day of Pentecost, it's recorded that he only used it once in verse 23. You delivered up and denied. You denied the Holy One and the just. Right? You asked for a murderer to be granted to you. You killed the Prince of Life. So of course, the Prince of Life could not remain in the grave, and the apostles were united witnesses of the fact of his resurrection. Verse 16, in his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So Peter said that it was in the name of Jesus that this man has been made whole. It means more than Peter said in Jesus' name. It means that Peter consciously did this in the authority and power of Jesus, not in the authority and power of Peter. Peter would not have even taken credit for the faith that was exercised in the healing. And so when God's people really do good in the world, they do it through faith in his name. The temptation is always to do things trusting in something or someone else, to trust in good intentions or talents and gifts or material resources, trust in reputation and prior success or hard work or smart work. Instead, we must always trust in and do good through faith in his name. Verse 17 and 18. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. So though Peter spoke boldly to them about their sin, he didn't hate them. He didn't say, yet now, you filthy, disgusting wretches. He still connected them as brethren. Notice that twice Peter accused them of denying Jesus in verse 13 and 14, uh, something Peter had himself done in the past. And so, Peter recognized that they called for the execution of Jesus in ignorance of God's eternal plan. This does not make him, uh, them innocent, but it did carefully define the nature of their guilt. If we sin in ignorance, it's still sin, but it's different from sin done with full knowledge. And so despite all the evil they did to Jesus, it didn't change or derail God's plan. God can take the most horrible evil and use it for good. Joseph could say to his brothers, You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. The same principle was at work in the crucifixion of Jesus and is at work in our own lives in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where it says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Verse 19 through 21. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who has preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. So as he did in his first sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter called upon the crowd to repent. He told them to turn around in their thinking and actions. Peter spoke boldly to them about their sin, but he didn't just want to make them feel bad. That wasn't the goal. The goal was to encourage them to repent and believe. Repentance does not describe being sorry, but describes the act of turning around. And as he used it in chapter 2, here also Peter made repent a word of hope. He told them that they had done wrong, but that they could turn it around and become right with God. Peter also knew the necessity of conversion, of God's work of bringing new life to us. Being a Christian is not turning over a new leaf. It's being a new creation in Jesus Christ, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, where it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So the your sins may be blotted out as the first benefit of repentance Peter presents to them. The one who repents and is converted is forgiven of their sins, and the record itself is erased. Praise God. And so 
the times of refreshing may come upon uh, come from the presence of the Lord is the second benefit of repenting and turning to God. In speaking of times of refreshing, Peter referred to the time when Jesus will return and rule the earth in righteousness. Peter went so far to say that he may send Jesus Christ, thus implying that if the Jewish people as a whole repented, God the Father would send Jesus to return in glory. So Peter makes it clear that Jesus will have uh, will remain in heaven until the times of restoration of all things, and since the repentance of Israel is one of all those th- uh, one of the all things, there is some sense in which the return of Jesus in glory will not happen until Israel repents. And Peter essentially offered Israel the opportunity to hasten the return of Jesus by embracing him on a national level, something that must happen before Jesus will return, as in Matthew chapter 23 and Romans chapter 11, verse 25 through 27, where it says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, so and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Verse 22 through 26. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall utterly be destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities." So the Jewish people of Peter's day were aware of the prophecy of Moses recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, where it says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. And uh, chapter 18, verses 18 and 19 in Deuteronomy, where it says, I'll raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. He will put my words in his Uh, And will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. So, But some thought that the prophet would be someone different than the Messiah. Peter made it clear that they're one and the same. And so the destruction promised in the prophecy would become the legacy of this generation of Jews. Many of this generation, certainly not all, rejected Jesus twice over. And so this is the third blessing that comes from repenting and turning to God is being spared this promised judgment. And so hidden in the idea of the promise to Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And in the words to you first is the undeveloped theme of the extension of the gospel to all the world, even to the Gentiles, everybody. And so we get the um, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. This is the fourth blessing that comes from repenting and turning to God. Jesus blesses us from heaven and does this by turning us away from our sins. God's desire to bless us and do good for us also includes his desire to turn us all away from our sins.